Welcome to episode 12 of the Money Scope podcast, shining a light deep inside personal finance for Canadian professionals. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, portfolio manager and head of research at PWL Capital, and Dr. Mark Soth, aka the Looney Doctor. Great. So, in the last couple of episodes, we've talked about investing using a corporation. And a corporation is a separate legal entity that we can use to conduct business and or to passively invest. And the most common potential advantage of that is using pre-tax, pre-personal tax dollars uh, to invest. So you pay a low corporate tax rate up front, invest money that you don't need personally uh, within the corporation. And then later on, you can take it out and pay tax at some time in the future, hopefully at a lower personal tax rate. And this setup makes sense from a policy perspective to promote reinvestment within small business corporations to help them grow their business. However, recent rule changes have been put in place to try to disincentivize the accumulation of a whole bunch of passive investments uh, within inside of one of these corporations. We also started talking about taxes within the corporation in those episodes, and we'll come back to that again today. Corporate taxes are impacted by the active business income, business expenses, investment income, and how you compensate yourself as an owner of the business. Yeah, and that issue of how we pay ourselves personally from a corporation is we're going to, go on and going to uh, hone in on today. And the way a corporation works, really, a corporation can regulate how your income flows to you. It's kind of like a big dam with all the business income flowing into the reservoir, and the money is then released by opening up different floodgates, like salary or different types of dividends that allows that money to flow it into your personal hands, at which point it usually triggers personal tax. Yeah, the dam analogy is, is uh, so good. You, you can use a corporation to smooth out the income that flows out to you personally, and that lets you manage your tax brackets over time, knowing which levers to pull to keep the money flowing efficiently when you consider both your personal and corporate taxes is also really important. It changes as the sources of income in your corporation changes. And also the planning that you do to compensate yourself today personally affects the options, the financial planning options that you're going to have later, like setting up an RSP account or an individual pension plan, which you can only do in the future if you've been paying yourself with a salary in the past. Yeah. Well, I think we've got the money scope ready to dive in. And we are going to come to cover some familiar territory, but it always looks different when you're entering in from the other end. So we're going to do that. Plus, we're going to looking into a lot of nooks and crannies that we haven't uh, looked to, uh, into at all yet. So here we go. So to kick this discussion off, we want to throw out a disclaimer. And I think this is important, really important. Anytime we're talking about taxes, the specific fact pattern of the situation can affect the relevance of various tax planning ideas for that situation. So that just be mindful of that as we're, as we're talking here. And in, in addition to that, there are exceptions to many of the things that we're going to talk about. So again, based on the specific fact pattern, there may be an exception to uh, any of the tax related ideas that we talk about today. We've done our best to be thorough covering these topics, but when it comes to tax planning, it's always sensible to get professional advice. So don't run off and take some of the stuff we talk about and try and do some crazy tax planning strategy without first getting, getting advice. Uh, we do also want to mention that given the complexity of today's topic, and I think, Mark, we agreed when we started recording, before we started recording, that this is probably our most ambitious episode to yeah. date in terms of the, the content we're covering. Uh, so we, we wanted more than our own eyeballs on the, uh, on the notes that we prepared for this. So we had input on this episode from Aravind Sethan Parapillai from Ironwood Wealth Management, from an expert in financial planning who I can attest to his ec expertise, but he, he wishes to remain anonymous. And then also from two tax specialized CPAs, Jacob Molosic and Spencer Brooks at Hendry Warren, which is a, an accounting firm in Ottawa. Uh, so we had lots of really valuable input. And I think Mark, you'd agree that the, the back and forth within that group was just, I mean, it was something else to be part oh, of. Yeah. No, it was, it was great. I mean, no, I don't, the thing I would say about this is I don't think anybody has really covered this topic like we're about to cover it today. And we're going to get into all sorts of things you're not going to hear commonly discussed. We've organized it and we put it into some practical applications that are the common things that hit people up. But you're not going yeah, to just yeah. find a, read this somewhere on the internet. I mean, there's no, nowhere, no. nowhere you're going to pick the brain trust like we've picked it for this one. No, you saw it as that group of people who are all highly qualified and intelligent. Even within that group, there was a lot of discussion and, and many debates about whether this or that is true or what we should think about it this this way or that way so yeah no and we've yeah, linked to we've linked to the CRA interpretive bulletins for some of the other things that are coming up as well just to make sure we keep 
our footnotes references going. And yep. the, the other thing I would point out about with this disclaimer is that, you know, when you're consulting a tax professional, knowing about these topics is really important. And that's going to help you get the most out of the interaction with them. You know, accountants are great at taking care of what you hand them. However, when you plan to using a corporation, yet they have to know all the details of your situation, including your goals and your long-term plan to be able to make a strategy to help you with that. Plus, there's also some strategies that even accountants don't readily consider unless you ask all the right questions and bring up some of the suggestions. Like, uh, as Ben said, there was stuff that we bounced around that people hadn't thought of, so it was really good. So we did enlist a lot of others to help us with this, and some of it's pretty wild. Yeah, okay. no, definitely. Yeah. I, I do want to say that any errors in the episode are our own. We, we yes. own the errors, even though we had all this input. Um, yeah. we, we take ownership of any errors if they exist. However, yeah. we were very thorough <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah, if, in preparing the notes. Yeah. No, if we find something, we'll do an addendum or we'll fix yeah. it. But yeah. uh, I think we've done as much due diligence as we can. Yeah. Okay. All right. With all that preamble, let's get right into talking about taxation of active business income. So when you earn business income, you can do that as an individual, which could be referred to as a sole proprietor. Or you could incorporate, which creates this separate legal entity from you to run the business through. And in the case of a small business in Canada, that's called a Canadian-controlled uh, private company, or CCPC. And you'll hear it called that. They also call, come in a bunch of different flavors. For example, a profession like, professional like a physician may have what was called a professional corporation, or in the case of a physician, a, an MPC, medical professional corporation. In general... Corporations may provide some liability protection for some businesses, but that doesn't usually do that for professional corporations. Now, from a tax standpoint, one of the main pillars of our tax code in Canada is this idea of tax integration. And what that is, we talked about it before, is that it aims to make people indifferent about whether they earn business income directly as an individual taxpayer or whether they flow that income through a corporation into their hands. Now, practically speaking, integration means that when you add up the corporate taxes plus the personal tax on the dividends that are paid out from what's left over, it should be approximately the same as if you just earned that income as a sole proprietor. Now, this is relevant to today's episode because tax integration is not perfect, and it works differently depending on whether you pay yourself salary or dividends. There's also some funny nuances that can actually break tax integration pretty substantially in certain cases. And the other important detail is that with a corporation, you can choose not to take all of your income personally in one shot. And that's the biggest difference. Even though the as it flows through, integration should make it roughly the same. The ability to defer some of that personal income into the future gives you that partial tax deferral. That's where the damn analogy comes in. And the corporation holds your pre-personal tax money, which is going to be more, obviously, uh, until you cho choose to open the floodgates down the road and release it. And you can use that money to invest along the way. Now, whether incorporated or not, the taxable income portion of your business income is net of business expenses. So it's not just what you make, it's what you spend to run your business. So revenue minus active uh, business expenses. Now, we talked about passive income uh, in episode 10. It's taxed a bit differently. What, but what counts as active income is pretty straightforward. It's generally any income other than the income that's earned from passive investments. Now, we are going to spend some time to talk about how the business deductions work. So the income coming in is pretty easy, but subtracting those deductions uh, for what is considered a business expense is much more uh, convoluted. Yeah. So what, one of the common myths is that corporations get special business deductions. I think Seinfeld had a bit about this. Just write it off. <laughs> um, but they, yeah. they, they, they generally don't, in, in Canada at least. Uh, there are some exceptions though. So health spending accounts are one. Uh, those can be set up uh, for incorporated businesses with a single employee, but an unincorporated business requires more than one employee. So that's an exception where corporations get slightly different treatment than a sole proprietorship. And another one is a defined benefit pension option, which is available to people with corporations. Those are called IPPs. We'll talk a little bit about, more about them later. Uh, those also offer certain deductions that are not available to an individual taxpayer with a sole proprietorship business. Um, other than those exceptions and maybe some others that, that I'm not thinking of or we're not thinking of, 
uh, an, ind an individual or non-incorporated business, a sole proprietorship, can deduct the same business, uh, business expenses as a corporation or an incorporated business. Uh, expenses are really important because they're deducted dollar for dollar against uh, income, against active income, and that reduces your tax bill. Uh, that the net income after deductions is what you pay tax on. So spending some money on something in the corporation, in, in the business that is deductible, is essentially buying that thing with pre-tax dollars, which can be a big, a big deal. Um, in in general, most business expenses are deductible in some form if they meet three important criteria. They're incurred to earn business income. They're not disallowed by the Income Tax Act. Now, the Income Tax Act specifically disallows certain things, and they're reasonable in the circumstances. Yeah, and that, that third one about reasonableness, uh, reasonableness of it is open to interpretation. And one thing it's important to realize is that CRA's interpretation is what matters. And yes, you can argue with them. But to argue with them will cost you money to defend yourself. So even if you're ultimately right, it can cost a lot uh, to show that you are. So it's important to talk with your accountant when considering business expenses that may fall into a gray area before you spend the money. And they'll either be aware of relevant interpretive bulletins that CRA has issued, or if there isn't one, they may have, they'll probably have a sense of what raises flags uh, through their experience with their clients. And that's probably one of the reasons why it's important to have an accountant that has experience with the type of business uh, that you're running so they can get that sense of what other business owners are doing and what gets flagged and what doesn't. Because you don't want to leave money on the table because you're afraid of CRA for what is actually a legitimate expense. But you also don't want to stick out like a sore thumb for the CRA buzzsaw. And even if you're ultimately right, it's an expensive road to get there. Now, there, there are a few exceptions where people do tend to get themselves into trouble uh, due to the rules and interpretations around reasonable, reasonableness. And we're going to talk about some of that specifically, but vehicles, entertainment, golf is particularly in there, and uh, vacation-style conferences would be examples. Another example is using a home office, which has some nuances to consider that could come out when you eventually go to sell your home by affecting your principal residence exemption. So that's the exemption that allows you to sell your house tax-free in Canada. So if you're balancing some of these things, you're not sure, definitely discuss that with your accountant. And it's also important to have a basic idea of how expenses get deducted and when. All right, so payroll is, is the most common recurring business expense. That's gonna include salary income paid. It's also going to include the employer portion of employment insurance premiums for non-arms length employees. And we're gonna dig more into that later, why that distinction is important. And Canada Pension Plan, the employer portion of Canada Pension Plan contributions. One important nuance with deducting salary as an expense is that it must be deducted against active business income. So for someone who's in retirement, and if their corporation becomes a holding company with investment income only and no active business income, using salary is not typically going to make sense because the deduction is not going to be, to be useful. Uh, you'd likely be mostly, mostly using dividends in that case anyway, by that point, to keep your corporation's investment income tax efficient, which we've covered in, in past episodes. And we'll also talk more about why that is uh, later. We know this is a common question because one of our listeners has already asked about it before we, before <laughs> yeah. we recorded this episode. Yep. Uh, the, the other common question here is when you have an active business income, you're lower than your usual salary. So if you usually earn some amount of money and pay yourself some amount of salary, if you have a year where your business income is lower than that, what does that mean? So for example, if you take a parental leave and the business income hit because you're no longer earning active income in the corporation uh, that, that goes with the parental leave happens, what happens to your salary deduction uh, if it exceeds your business income? So you can actually carry some salary deduction backwards to apply against active income from a previous year as long as the salary is reasonable. Just a fun little fun little nuance there. Yep. Uh, rent, office expenses, and other operating costs for the business are also going to be deductible against income. Some expenses like meals and entertainment are 50% deductible, and they've also got to be considered reasonable. Reasonableness is something that we're going to come back to many times throughout this, this episode. Uh, as we alluded to in the previous section, there are some expenses that are explicitly disallowed, like golf green fees and membership dues. Yeah, I, I was wondering about Taylor Swift tickets. We actually got some. And uh, I think if we were to use those as a deduction, we could probably net drop our net income down to zero. 
Yeah, it's doubtful that that one would be allowed unless you're recruiting patients there, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we need, need like a uh, Elton John concert or something to get the demographic that I go after. But <laughs> uh, um, the, the, the other thing to be aware of when you're spending corporate dollars is that the expense may not be all deductible at once. So for example, when you buy durable business equipment like machinery or something like that, the cost is not usually going to be completely deducted against your business income upfront in, in that year. Because the equipment has durable value, but depreciates over time, only the depreciation of the asset is deductible in a given tax year. And that's called the capital cost allowance. And there are different categories for different types of equipment based on how quickly, quickly they're expected to depreciate to prescribe how fast their cost can be deducted over time. Yeah, so it's not going to be all at once. That's the important thing to remember with that. When you spend that big chunk of money, you're not going to save the taxes on it right away. Right. And the other thing that it's important to understand is that if you get personal benefit from the business assets, then that's usually not a free lunch either. Well, I guess it could be a free lunch or, or a 50% deductible lunch if it's for business purposes. But uh, other than that, probably not. Uh, in general, if there's personal use of company assets for non-business purposes or even access for personal use, uh, then that can be considered another form of compensation that comes from the company, even though it's not a salary per se. The personal benefit portion could be consider, considered a taxable benefit when it is like that and subject to personal tax, just like it was regular income, the value of that. And some common areas where people get entangled with this are company vehicles and recreational properties. For example, if you own a cottage through your corporation, anytime it's available for personal use as a tax is, is a taxable benefit equal to the market value of having had to rent it for that time period. And this is important to understand because this is, I think, where people get mixed up. Is this this means that technically, let's say the cottage is rent out rented out for business purposes for four months and it's not meant to rent it out for eight months, even if you use it for one of those eight months, the taxable benefit would be calculated for the eight months that it was available for use. Yeah, that one's crazy. Yeah. I, I personally didn't know that one. That came up in our brain trust discussion with uh, with the accountants yeah. that if it's available for use, it's as if you're getting a taxable benefit of using it. Yeah. I thought you had to actually be using it for the taxable benefit. So that's yeah, that's pretty scary. And, and then this question of of can I buy a cottage in my corporation? That's come up for my clients many, many times because you see this big pile of money in the corporation. It's like, wow, I could buy a <laughs> cottage, but only only if I use my pre, pre-personal tax dollars. Can I buy it in the corporation? Yeah. Technically, yes, you can, but it can get very messy with taxable benefits. Yeah. And generally, we say it's probably not worthwhile. Um, but again, that's one of those things where generally it's not worthwhile, but every every case has to be evaluated. <laughs> yeah, it could be different. Um, you, you can get yourself in even bigger trouble uh, than than what we were just talking about with the regular taxable benefit if you go crazy and buy something really expensive that doesn't have an active rental market, because the deemed benefit of of like the the cottage that we talked about is the it's it's effectively the, the amount of rent that you would have paid to have access to that cottage. But if something doesn't have a rental market, what do you do? Well, this has been this has been tested in. Uh, in court, so if something doesn't have an active rental market, like a luxury property, uh, for example, where, where the fair market rent, because the property is so luxurious that there aren't they aren't available for rent, so if the fair market rent does not provide for a reasonable return on the value or cost of the property, um, th- that that's what ends up being the uh, the benefit is is that reasonable return. So this one court case specifically, the court deemed that the benefit was greater than the, the market value of rent. And instead it was deemed equal to the return the corporation could have earned on the invested capital, plus the operating costs of the property, which could end up being way more than rent. <laughs> oh yeah, especially if it's like an aircraft or a private yacht. And unfortunately that principle applies to private aircrafts and and yachts too. They specifically mentioned that. So sorry, sorry to crush all the dreams out there. <laughs> Yeah, we'll put the CRA interpretive bulletin into the footnotes. Anyways, the other thing that we can get is a vehicle and recreational property costs are pretty they're pretty easy to quantify and aside business versus personal unit usage. However, there are all sorts of other expenses that are pretty hard to track or identify. 
uh, more than what we could possibly cover today. We just wanted to highlight some of the issues that non-monetary compensation can actually count as taxable income for you personally. So be sure to discuss those types of expenses with your accountant if you're not sure. Yeah, I, I mentioned it earlier, but those those pre-personal tax corporate dollars, they, they kind of burn a hole in people's pocket. Oh, they're they have exciting. a tendency to get people, right. Oh, it's yeah, a big exciting. pile of money. Um, but, but, but then when you think, well, 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 I have to pay whatever, 50% in tax, so I don't have that much money actually. But if That's I could only buy it in the corporation, but then you, yeah. you start thinking about the costs in terms of taxable benefits and the complexity of accounting for all of that stuff in the long run, I, I don't think that can be underestimated. Yeah, it's a buzzkill. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the other the other thing that comes up, uh, and this I see this one come up every December and again around Valentine's Day, is that an employer can give gifts, awards, and rewards. So you may give gifts for special occasions, awards for specific achievements, or rewards for performance. And this probably gets especially dicey when you're talking about a spouse, probably for many reasons. But uh, the gifts and rewards are generally considered to be taxable benefits by CRA. And that includes non-cash or cash-like amounts. Uh, but those that are under $500 in value are often excluded. But not always. There's like a lot of rules around this. There's no way to easily summarize this for a podcast. Uh, and of course, the general rule of uh, having that principle of reasonableness applies. A common issue that comes up is when benefits for shareholder employees are different from benefits from all employees. So if your corporation hire, has more than one employee and you treat them differently, if a shareholder employee gets benefits that the non-shareholder employee does not, then that's going to be deemed to be a shareholder benefit. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's let's talk about how net active income is taxed. When you take the business income from operations, so your active business income, and deduct expenses, that's your net active business income. And similar to personal taxes, that amount is subject to corporate tax rates. Unlike personal income tax, though, where there are many tax brackets that are progressive with increasing income, there are only two main effective tax rates for corporations, and that is the small business deduction rate, or the SBD rate, and the general corporate tax rate. So tax rates on active corporate income can be very low if the SBD applies. Generally, that low rate applies for the first five hundred thousand dollars of net income. And I said generally, there are there's uh, one ex well various ways that there can be exceptions yeah. to that. We'll talk more about that <laughs> that later. Uh, and then there are also some nuances to the SBD threshold, and 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 that's what we'll we'll cover in some detail uh, later on. The Combined federal and provincial SBD rate varies from as low as 9% in Manitoba to 12% in Ontario and Quebec, and most provinces for the SBD rate are in the 11 to 12% range. That is a lot lower than the general corporate tax rate, which ranges from as low as 23% in Alberta to around 30% in the maritime provinces. And Ontario and Quebec have 26.5% as their general business tax, tax rate, and BC, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan are at 27%. So it varies across provinces, but on average, sort of 27 to 28%. Yeah, so the, the next thing to understand is that that's how it gets taxed into the corporation, but then you have to flow that out uh, as, as dividends. So that business tax on active income is the first part of the journey of your income passing into the corporation, uh, but money left or is left over after, after you pay that tax. And that money that's left over after the expenses and the taxes have been paid is called retained earnings. And what you can do with those retained earnings, well, your corporation could invest those retained earnings in stocks or bonds or in various investment funds that we've talked about. Uh, they could save that money for an upcoming business expenditure or other investments that are coming up. Or they could pay that retained earning money out to, as dividends to the shareholders. So they make that decision just like any other company. Now, when you do eventually pay money out of the corporation as dividends to spend it personally, those dividends are then taxed at your personal tax rates. And there's some accounting gymnastics about how that actually happens uh, because it's trying to account for the fact that the corporation has already paid some of the tax on it. So this is that tax integration at work. So in Canada, we have a system of dividend gross up and credits to account for those taxes paid by the corporation when they flow out uh, to an individual. And we did touch on this in episode nine for dividends from publicly traded companies. However, there are some extra wrinkles for private corporations. So we'll start by comparing 
income that was taxed at this small business deduction rate, and then we'll talk about income taxed at the general corporate tax rate because they're treated differently. All right, so that's going to be talking about regular uh, or, or non-eligible dividends to, to start. Um, so income tax at the small business rate gets dispensed as what are called non-eligible dividends. For determining the personal income tax on a dividend, the, there's that gross up and credit system that you mentioned. So first there's a dividend gross up. For a non-eligible dividend, that means the dividend is multiplied by 1.15. So this means that a $100,000 dividend that you've received personally would count as $115,000 of taxable income. That gross up is meant to approximate what the income was before corporate taxes were paid. So you're, you're approximating pre-corporate tax dollars. Uh, and then the grossed up amount is taxed along with whatever other income you have through your marginal tax brackets. And then after your taxes are calculated, and the order matters, yeah. after your taxes are calculated, a dividend tax credit is then applied to reduce the amount of tax that you owe uh, overall. Uh, the credit is meant to account for the taxes that the corporation has already paid. So the actual credit's going to vary from province to province since the pr provincial portion of the small business tax rates are variable across provinces. The combined federal Ontario tax credit for non-eligible dividends is 12.0164% of the grossed up dividend amount. It's a very specific yeah. <laughs> number. Yeah, lots of decimal, yeah, lots of uh, significant figures. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, now, to, to take that to an example, if an Ontario corporation earns $100,000 $100, taxed at the small business rate of 12.2%, that leaves $87,800 of, uh, of 80, $87.8,000 of retained earnings in the corporation, and that can then be paid out as a non-eligible dividend. For personal taxes, that $87.8,000 would be grossed up by one15 so that grossed up amount ends up being $100,970. Now, notably, that's a bit more than the actual pre-tax corporate earnings because we know, we know we're following the example with $100,000 uh, to start. At the top personal marginal rate in Ontario, which is 53.53% at the time of recording, uh, that ends up being $54,049 in tax. But there's also going to be a tax credit to reduce that amount owing. So again, the combined federal Ontario tax credit for regular dividends is 12.0164% of the grossed up amount of the dividend, which is notably a little bit less than the actual corporate taxes paid. So that is a $12,133 tax credit, reducing the net personal tax to $41,916. In this case, the combined corporate and personal tax rate on the dividend is going to be 54.12%. Now compare that to the 53.53% for having earned the income personally. We can see that there's a little bit of a tax integration inefficiency. Um, now that, that number, the 54.12% on total taxes between the corporation and the, and the individual is really important because looking at only the personal side of the dividend, which many people do, can lead to quite a bit of confusion around the relative tax efficiency of dividends. Yeah, that that happens all the time. I literally answered an email about that yesterday where someone was talking about how they're going to get pay such a low tax rate because they were just going to give themselves dividends, but they were totally ignoring the fact that the corporation paid tax on it. And, you know, this is one of the ways people get confused to think dividends are better than salary. But as you just showed with your example, it, it's not. I mean, it's a complicated process, so it's no wonder people get confused but people forget that both to take both sides. So that tax rate on that $87,000 and $87,800 non-eligible dividend is 47.74%. And that's the number you'll see when you look online about what different tax rates are for dividends. You'll see that 47.74% uh, for the example we gave, which is less than the rate that you'd see for salary. But that's not accounting for the corporate taxes. When you put the corporate taxes in there, it's going to be actually a little bit more. So people are tempted to think that dividends are more efficient because of that. Now, tax integration, generally, if you look at, we did gave one specific example at, at a top tax bracket in Ontario. But if you look across the country, tax integration generally does, does not favor dividends over salary when all of the money flows through. Now, there are still some exceptions. For example, at the top marginal rate in Saskatchewan, where dividends have a slight advantage, it's like 0.4%. It's going to be 0.1% as of July 2024. So it's going to be almost exactly the same. 
And there's also some exceptions where various tax brackets in some provinces will favor dividends and others won't. I mean, historically, dividends were favored at the top tax rate uh, until relatively recently uh, over the last you know, number of years. And that may explain why some people still hold on to this belief that dividends are more tax efficient than they were at one point. But, you know, when the rules change, then that changes as well. Yeah. Now, even though we're saying that integration slightly favors salary, the potential advantage of dividends is that you delay taking them until some point in the future. And if you do that, you're benefiting from a deferral on the personal portion of your tax bill, which can be useful. Uh, it basically means that you can invest your pre-personal tax corporate retained earnings inside of the corporation, deferring the personal portion of tax. That can very well, well work out better than salary in the long run if you can grow that capital more tax efficiently inside the corporation than you could personally. However, it may not be better compared to tax sheltered accounts or even personal accounts at low personal tax rates if, if those are available to you. So for someone who's personally taxed at the highest rate, Maybe not so interesting to pay salary and invest personally, but if someone has a very low personal tax rate or a family member with a low personal tax rate, uh, or if there are tax sheltered accounts available, that was one of the first uh, papers I ever did on this type of tax planning was, does it make sense to take money out of the corporation to invest in the RSP and the TFSA? Mm -hmm. And I found that generally it, it does if you have a long uh, time horizon. Yep. Um, yep. Not even that long, actually, for some of them. Yeah, for RSPs, it makes sense because you're not really, you, you can defer the personal tax still by paying yourself out some salary yeah. to put in the RSP. The TFSA, you're potentially taking a big tax hit up front, so you've got to have a little bit of runway yeah. for it to make sense if you have a high uh, personal yeah, tax I, rate. I would make two comments on that. As one, I, I mean, I think it was around 10 years or less for sort of a reasonable variable. Yep. And the thing I think people need to remember is that your investing time frame is actually when you die. So yeah. it's going to yeah, be yeah. most likely more than 10 years, I would certainly hope for most people. So generally, especially during your working years, you know, generally it's going to make sense because hopefully you're going to live more than 10 years in retirement. Oh yeah, that, that I mean, total digression, but that uh, p people framing their time horizon as the date at which they will retire, I think is such a problem in financial planning. It comes up in asset allocation discussions too. Well, my time horizon is only five years because I'm going to retire. Well, no. I don't think you're going to die in five years. <laughs> no, and I, I, I brought it up just because I know this RSP TFSA question still comes up. Like you found that answer. I found that answer. Uh, Jamie Gollenbeck's found the same answer. It's been shown repeatedly by many people using different methodology, but it still comes up all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it's yeah. one of those things that... Um, uh, I can't remember what the exact quote is, but like uh, r research changes one death at a time. It's the same kind of idea <laughs> where there's this there's this notion that dividends are really tax efficient and everything should stay in the corporation. And I think things like that, uh, commonly held wisdom like that just changes very slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, and the other thing is, again, digression here, but th there are ways to get money out of a corporation relatively tax efficiently, like mm -hmm. realizing a capital gain in the corporation using a capital dividend account. Funding a TFSA that way doesn't have a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot, there's no runway if you can get money out through the capital dividend account. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah. And yeah. The, other thing, the other thing that comes up is people have this giant unused RSP contribution room that's sitting there unused and they have all this money sitting in their corporation. They could move that into their RSP which is tax sheltered from the tax exposed account with no cost. I mean, there's no corporate cost because you pay the salary. It's a deduction for the corporation. You put it in the RSP. It's a deduction against your personal income. It's a hundred percent shift over to a tax sheltered account. But the, I know a lot of people that have these big RSP contribution room that's not used and they have all this money in their corporation. It's one of the most common things I see when I help people out. Which is crazy. We, we talked yeah. about tax drag in a past episode. You have way more tax drag in the corporation than you do in the RSP yeah. or the or the TFSA. Yeah. Um, anyway, bit of a digression there. No, useful, important one useful. though. It's important because yeah, it, it comes up all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the other way that tax deferral can ultimately, ultimately become, tax deferral using the corporation can become a major tax savings is if you take dividends out in a future year when your tax rate is lower than if you took the money out now. So if you're going to take a dividend out now and you're going to pay tax at, at a very high personal tax rate, whereas in the future you expect your income uh, tax bracket to be lower because you're not maybe earning as much income or your expenses aren't as high, then taking money out in the future at a lower tax rate can make um, retaining 
in the corporation investing and paying dividends later increasingly attractive. Um, so that's a that's another big one. Now that's going to depend on what your future withdrawals from the corporation are going to look like and other sources of income. Um, and that's going to depend on how much you need to spend and also how much you need to take out of the corporation to keep the refundable taxes on investment income flowing efficiently. So a lot of different variables there that are going to that are going to influence what your future tax bracket is. And then it's also important to keep in mind that future tax rates can can change. Now that, that can present tax planning opportunities if there are years where tax rates become more advantageous, but it, it also presents a risk where if tax rates go up and you've left all your money inside the corporation, then it, it can actually make you a little bit worse off than if you'd taken the money out earlier at the lower tax rates. Now, this is an interesting point. That depends not only on personal tax brackets, but it can also show up tax rate changes that can be detrimental or, or beneficial, I guess. Well, yeah, definitely either, either way, uh, that can show up through changes in, in personal tax rates, personal tax brackets, but it can also show up through changes in the federal SBD rate. And that's because the dividend tax credit is based on the corporate SDB rate, uh, SBD rate at the time that a dividend is paid, not the tax rate actually paid on the active business income when it was earned. So if the government reduces the corporate SBD rate, they're generally going to modify the gross up and tax credit to reflect the lower corporate tax rate paid on retained earnings. Yeah, so just to, to kind of ex- explain that a, a little bit more, is basically, so if the corporate tax rate dropped over time, you would have paid corporate taxes at a higher rate previously, and then now when you're sending the money out and the corporate tax rate is lower, you're not going to get as much credit for that as you would have in the past if you'd float it through right away. So when corporate tax rates are dropping over time, uh, then and you're holding on to money, it can be a disadvantage. If corporate tax rates rise over time, uh, then it could be potentially a, an advantage because you'll get a bigger credit down the road yep. than what you actually paid the tax on. So that's a bit mind bending, but it, it is. And, I mean, the problem is no one can actually predict which way. Uh, tax rates are going to move in the future, although it's hard to imagine corporate tax rates, specifically the small business deduction rate, getting any lower yeah. over time. I mean, it's pretty low. So if there was a risk, there would probably be to the upside, but no one knows that. Right. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that's common advice is to take the minimal amount of personal income that you possibly can, which, as you mentioned, usually is dividends because then you're going to leave more tax deferred money invested within the corporation than if you moved it out dollar for dollar salary. However, the optimal answer on how and how much uh, to flow out of the corporation actually requires more consideration and planning than that. So dividends also impact how tax efficient the corporate investing is due to their relationship with the refundable dividend taxes on hand. Uh, We'll come back to that in the next section or the next episode when we talk about planning for the optimal salary and dividend mix. So there's other interactions that go on there. Some of the answer also depends on the corporate uh, income tax to the general rate because corporate tax to the income tax at the general rate is going to generate what's called grip. And that gives the corporation the ability to pay out eligible dividends uh, personally, uh, which also enters the picture. So all or most of the income that a corporation pays at the higher general corporate tax rate, that was around you know, 27, 28% across the country, uh, that gets passed through to shareholders as eligible dividends. And in provinces with the corporate tax rate over 28%, all of the retained earnings from active income taxed at that rate can be paid out as eligible dividends. So that would be all of Atlantic Canada, for example. In provinces with lower tax rates, it's partial because the grip is calculated uh, not dollar for dollar. So GRIP, which stands for General Rate Income Pool, is one of these notional accounts that that we've talked about before. They exist only on paper for tax tracking purposes. And basically, the GRIP balance is how much money a corporation is allowed to pay out as eligible dividends. So it's going to be how much you generate minus how many eligible dividends you pay out. That's the basic calculation. And in episode 10, we talked about that with investment income, where a dollar of eligible income, eligible dividend income is received by the corporation that generates $1 of grip. And then your corporation gives the has the ability then to pay that $1 out as an eligible dividend to you personally. And that passes through uh, quite efficiently. Now, in contrast with active income, 
group is determined by multiplying the net active income by 0.72. And that's why I said 28% earlier, because only 72% or 0.72 of the active income taxed at the general corporate rate allows you to have this grip. So it's going to be less. Yep. All right, I'm going to take us through a quick example. A um, lot, lot, of, lot of numbers here. Yeah. Uh, but I'll try and illustrate how grip works with active income. So if we start with a corporation that has $100,000 of net income taxed at the general rate, we're going to get $72,000 of grip based on that multiplier. If this was an Alberta corporation, the general corporate tax rate is only 23%. So there'd be $77,000 of retained earnings. Of that, $72,000 could be dispensed as eligible dividends and the remaining $5,000 as non-eligible dividends. So we'll follow that Alberta example by flowing all of the money through to a shareholder. The $72,000 of retained earnings is dispensed as eligible dividends and it's going to get grossed up by one38 to give $99,360 of personal taxable income. So that's pretty close to simulating that original $100,000 of uh, corporate income, but not, not quite perfect. The top marginal tax rate in Alberta is 48% personally, which gives $47,692 in tax on that $99,000 of personal income. But then that's not quite the end of the story. Eligible dividends come with an enhanced dividend tax credit. For Alberta, that reduces taxes owing by 23.1398% of the grossed up amount <laughs> to give a, a $22,992 credit. A $22,992 credit. Uh, that, that makes the net tax on the $72,000 eligible dividend come out to $24,700 or, or an eligible dividend tax rate of 34.31%. The $5,000 non-eligible dividend would pass through using the 1.15% gross up and regular credit or non-eligible credit for a net tax of $2,116. When you add up the corporate tax paid plus the taxes paid on the non-eligible and eligible dividends, the total tax on $100,000 of corporate income comes out to $49,816. So a 49.82% total tax rate, corporate and personal combined. That's higher than the top Alberta personal tax bracket of 48% for salary income. So again, in this case, tax integration does not currently favor corporations if all the money is just flowed through compared to top uh, personal, personal rates, flowed through as, as dividends. Uh, the main exception at the time of recording anyway is New Brunswick, where tax integration favors dividends by 0.5% for uh, general corporate tax. Yeah, so it's pretty close, but people get... Uh messed up by this because they see that 34.31% eligible dividend tax rate on the internet and they're like, wow, I'm going to give myself eligible dividends. It's awesome. But if you factor in all of the the active income tax that, that was there, it, it's actually more than personal. Yeah. So, and then, you know, as we've alluded to, tax integration for these dividends is imperfect and it really does vary by province and even by tax bracket. So, it tends to favor salary over dividends in most jurisdictions when you're looking at the top personal tax brackets. However, the magnitude also varies when you move down through the tax brackets into lower income levels, even within a, a given province. So in very low tax brackets, the dividend tax credit may sometimes even be lower than the taxes owing. So this is especially true for eligible dividends. And that brings up a, an important issue, and that's that this dividend and enhanced dividend tax credit is a non-refundable tax credit. So you'd want to make sure that even if you're using dividends and getting this low or even negative effective tax rate, you have to pay enough personal taxable income to actually use that tax credit because it only offsets tax that you owe. If you don't use it, then you're going to lose it. So you won't actually get that, that negative effective tax rate unless you pay enough income to be actually paying some tax. So we'll come back to that and some other practical nuances, episode 13, uh, when we talk about optimizing our salary and dividend mix, but it's worth hearing it more than once because it confuses a lot of people. And you can usually see calculations on the internet and other places that are pretty much always done at top personal tax rates. Now, some of us do spend money and take money in top personal tax rates, but a, a lot of people, probably the majority of people actually do not. So... Uh, when you look at that, it's important to think about what it happens at lower tax rates uh, for tax integration. What actually does happen, I've gone through this, is that the tax integration becomes tighter. So there's less of a penalty for flowing active income through a corporation. 
as you move down to the lower tax brackets. And if you're talking about small business deduction income going through and non-eligible dividends, it's, it becomes very minuscule. So it, the tax integration functions really, really well at lower tax brackets and, and there's often a bit of a penalty at the top tax brackets. Uh, now, one, another exception here, Nova Scotian dividends may be more efficient than salaried incomes less than $112,000 a year, but they actually have a 0.23% advantage in the highest tax bracket there. So you can see within, within Nova Scotia, if you move through the tax brackets, it can be an advantage in some tax brackets and then a disadvantage in other tax brackets. So is it, we really actually mean it when we're saying to consult your account for your specific situation because it really does actually depend on how much you're paying yourself and and your province. Now, I do know some accounts will say, yeah, you know, it's all just so close enough. Don't even bother to worry about it. Like it's, we're talking little bits here and there. Uh, but if you are talking about a, a substantial amount, it can make a big difference over time. Now, I'll just give an example of that for general corporate income taxed integration between salary versus dividends is huge. So for new example in Newfoundland, the cost of flowing income through a corporation as eligible dividends instead of salary can be over 7% hmm. difference. And it can be over 8% in the lowest tax brackets there in Newfoundland. So that's pretty big and substantial. That's a big difference. Uh, but for most provinces, it's about 2% in efficiency, which, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but we get we would get really upset if we were paying a 2% uh, management fee on our investments. Well, we're paying a 2% you know, management fee to the government on our income. So you might want to think about that. Now, there are some exceptions. BC, Northwest Territories, the Yukon, they have less than a half percent of inefficiency. It's so close there that it's, it's probably not worth worrying about at all. And while I was prepping for this episode, I actually made a tax table calculator that shows tax integration for active corporate income in the different provinces and across the different tax brackets, just so people could look and see that uh, on their own if they want to for their own situation. Now, of course, you want to consult an accountant, but it, it's more than just the top tax bracket stuff that you usually see. So I'll put a link to that on the on the episode page, which will be on moneyscope.ca. Uh, now, one interesting piece that I don't think we mentioned in our episode on corporate investment taxation that we did is that tax integration cost of flowing interest or foreign dividend uh, investment income worsens as you go and you look at lower personal tax brackets. So we ran through that at the highest personal tax bracket like everybody else does. But with this calculator, I, I did it through all the different tax brackets. And that cost of, of flowing it through gets worse as you're in a lower personal income. So corporations best actually if you're in a high high income tax rate for the for that investment income. And I mentioned that because a lot of studies that look at corporate investing just look at the top tax bracket. And real life uh, may actually be less favorable, favorable towards the corporation uh, if you have foreign investments in, in the mix there. And, you know, that, that routine earning and spending uh, can plop yourself into different tax brackets. Now, if your alternative to the corporation is investing via low-income spouse, which we'll talk about later, that could be part of the tax planning that you do instead if you're in some of those lower tax brackets. Yeah. And then the, the impact of paying dividends to a lower income spouse or, or when drawing a very low income yourself from the corporation can be pretty significant in, in some situations. Uh, that the grossed up taxable income is what's used for income tests and benefits. So I mentioned earlier that the order of the calculation of the gross up, your full um, taxable income, and then later the credit the order matters, and the order matters because one of the reasons it matters is that the grossed up portion of taxable income is what's used for calculating your, your entitlement to income tested benefits, like the Canada Child Benefit or Old Age Security. So dividends could effectively bump your, your net taxes versus benefits disproportionately if those end up getting clawed back. I mean, the, the, the marginal effective tax rate when you account for uh, benefit clawbacks, clawbacks can be very, very high. Yeah. And dividends are gonna are gonna be worse for that than than salary because of the gross up. So uh, the gross uh, up would basically make it like for a non eligible dividend, you paying the clawback would be fifteen percent faster, and then for an eligible dividend, be thirty eight percent faster on what is already a pretty aggressive clawback rate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you combine the clawback with your actual taxes based on the regular tax brackets, and your effective tax rate can be incredibly high. Uh, if you're in those brackets where, or if you're at an income level where those those benefits uh, 
matter. So that's one of the other thing, misconceptions generally about dividend income being more efficient is that the fact that the, the gross up can really affect your entitlement to benefits more aggressively than than uh, salary would. Um, and then on the, on the other side of the ledger, RSP contributions with their deductions can also reduce taxable income and can reduce that that clawback. So making an RSP contribution to reduce your taxable income, the the effective benefit of that, or I guess it's the, the opposite, that instead of having a huge effective tax rate, you're, you're saving at a huge effective rate by reducing your taxable income using RSP contributions. Um, so that, that could tip the scales further toward uh, salary in some situations because it generates that that RSP room. Um, the, the, the effective tax rates in those clawback situations, I can't emphasize enough, can be just uh, astronomical. Um, I, I think the take-home message, though, is that there are differences in tax integration between provinces and across tax brackets. So while we can say that generally salary is overall more efficient from an integration perspective, you do also need to consider your own specific situation. So rules of thumb like salary is better or salary is more efficient may not always uh, work out in, in your specific situation. We, we do also need to cover the, this interesting idea of broken tax integration. So we we're just talking about integration inefficiencies where when you flow all the income through, salary can be a little bit more favorable, generally speaking, than dividends, although there are exceptions. But there are some special cases where tax integration is straight up broken. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not even an inefficiency. It's like uh, stuff's not working the way that it was supposed to. Yeah. Uh, tax integration works on the assumption that, that the federal and provincial governments are going to treat the small business deduction the same way. But there are a couple of cases where they don't. And that causes breaks in tax integration that can really favor, favor or penalize corporate owners depending on, on their specific situation. So Saskatchewan... In that province, the provincial SBD limit is $600,000, but the federal, as we mentioned earlier, is still $500,000. So Saskatchewan decides they want their SBD to be $600,000. Great, but that doesn't affect the federal SBD for someone living in Saskatchewan. Uh, so as of July 1st, 2024, income below $500,000 is taxed at 11%, and that's 9% federal and 2% provincial tax at the SBD rate. Income between five hundred thousand and six hundred thousand has a hybrid rate of seventeen percent, where the higher general federal corporate tax rate of fifteen percent is applied, plus the two percent provincial SBD rate. So over six hundred thousand dollars, we're back to the normal twenty-seven percent. But there's this funny transition range um, that has uh, that has a different situation. Now that also creates a break in tax integration. So income above five hundred thousand and below six hundred thousand dollars. The corporation is paying tax at a lower rate than the national average general corporate tax rate of around 28%. That 28% is why the GRIP calculation is 72% of the original income. But the GRIP is generated based on the federal tax rate. So in that hybrid or transition range of federal general rate and provincial SBD rate, the court pays a lower hybrid tax rate on active income and the shareholder gets some eligible dividends through GRIP because of the federal portion of the tax being paid at the general corporate rate. And the net result is that the personal tax savings from the eligible dividend, from paying eligible dividends, is 5 to 7% in that range compared to salary. So this type of benef beneficial anomaly from broken tax integration was also created in Ontario and New Brunswick when the, when the passive income rules were put in place. Yeah, so it, it uh, caused a, a big break there as well. And it's really quite interesting. I mean, in Ontario and New Brunswick, there was this beneficial anomaly created when the federal government sought to penalize too much passive income in corporations. So the intent with that was that for the small business deduction threshold, that it would get reduced uh, for passive incomes over $50,000 a year. We talked about that in episode 10. But just to review it quickly, the usual $500,000 small business deduction threshold shrinks at a rate of 5 to 1. So when the passive income is over $50,000 per year, the active income that's that gets that favorable rate is reduced at a rate of five to one so it grinds it down really really quickly now just i'll give that an example of some numbers let's say i have a hundred thousand dollars of passive income so that's fifty thousand dollars over that fifty thousand dollar limit and due to the passive income rules in the following fiscal year the spd threshold is going to shrink uh, by two hundred and fifty thousand dollars because it's that five to one clip 
uh, from the $500,000 that it usually would be. So any net active income that's over $250,000 is gonna get taxed at the general corporate tax rate. So what was intended with that was a bump of the general corporate tax on income uh, over $250,000 to jump up from 12% to 27%. A big jump right there, that's like 15%, and occurring at a five to one clip. So five times 15% massive income tax jump. However, with that shrinking SPD also comes the ability to pay out eligible dividends instead of non-eligible dividends. So as we went through, there's some personal tax savings due to the enhanced dividend tax credit. So that helps to offset some of that big corporate tax jump by having lower personal taxes as long as, as you flow that money uh, through the corporation yourself as dividends to use up the grip that was generated. So what happened in Ontario and New Brunswick is that the provinces didn't follow the federal government lead on this passive income tax change to grind down the SPD. So what happens is the federal corporate tax rate jumps when the SPD grinds down, but the provincial tax rate stays at that very low SPD rate for that first $500,000 in net income. So now you could potentially have a $500,000 transition zone where you get this blended tax rate that's going to be a blend of the federal general rate at the higher amount and the small SPD rate. So I'm just going to give an example with that too. So let's say you have an Ontario corporation that has this $100,000 of passive income last year, and it has $400,000 of active income this year. So the SPD rate was reduced to that $250,000 that we talked about, and that gets taxed at 12.2%. Now the next $150,000 that's over that gets taxed at this hybrid rate of 18.2%. So that's 15% from the federal rate, plus 3.2% from the Ontario rate. And so that's 18.2%. Now, if they had an income over $500,000, that income above the $500,000 is gonna be taxed at the usual federal and provincial rate of 26.5%, so closer to that national average. Now, there is this big window between the SPD level that's got shrunken down and $500,000 where you get this blended rate. So again, the grip is calculated off the federal rate, which is what took that big jump. So the corporate income in that hybrid rate zones is 18.2%, but the corporation can dispense eligible dividends as if it had been taxed at that full rate of 26.5%. So this is how tax integration is broken in favor of the owner. It was designed around that 26.5%, but the corporation is only paying 18. And then you get to pay out those eligible dividends, have a lower personal tax rate. And when you add up the blended corporate rate and the lower personal tax rate, flowing all that money through is about 2.2% less total tax in the top Ontario tax bracket. And when you look at it through lower tax brackets, uh, the break in tax integration actually gets bigger and bigger. So it's more like a 5% advantage when you're in the lowest tax brackets. And if you go through that exercise I just went through in New Brunswick, it's a massive advantage. It's like in the 7 to 10% range in New Brunswick. Yeah. Tax code is, is super complicated, which is a, that's a big issue. But whenever changes are made like this, there's a pretty significant risk of unintended consequences, which is exactly what we, what we see there. Yeah, I've, re I've written about this a couple times in my blog. I think meddling with the tax code is kind of like a Jurassic Park episode where, you know, they have this great idea about how they're going to me meddle with the genome and then predictably bad stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> and I also wrote about it, this this anomaly in particular, and then I, a, a doc from New Brunswick piped in that finally, finally their government was doing something to attract physicians by having <laughs> broken tax integration so badly. And we actually did go, we went and checked out Fredericton uh, when we were thinking about where we wanted to move to, we ended up staying in Ontario. But And actually, we've actually used this anomaly a few times now at this point. It can be a good way to flow through uh, eligible dividends uh, to personal money. So now the important thing with that is if you aren't flowing the money out of the corporation as eligible dividends, then you have paid more tax up front due to the loss of the federal SPD. And you don't get that benefit of the broken integration unless you pay out dividends. And now if that's many years later, then the value of those savings from the GRIP account does erode with inflation because the GRIP account is priced in nominal dollars. So the value that represents with tax savings is going to get smaller and smaller as time goes by. People don't appreciate that. So even though tax integration was broken here, favoring moving, favoring uh, 
corporate owners, it actually still does accomplish this task of incentivizing people to move money out of their corporation. So that was actually what the intent of the legislation was, was to move money out of your corporations and not just keep it invested there. But I think they didn't mean it for it to be a carrot. So they wanted it to be a big stick instead, but instead we got a carrot. Yeah, those changes caused such a big fuss. And I remember it, at, at first people thought that they were paying more tax and then slowly people realized they're just losing some tax deferral. So, okay, maybe it's not as big of a deal. And then later people started to figure out that this break in integration actually makes things potentially more efficient in, in these certain cases. So it was, uh, it was well, interesting think, to see people go from like panic to uh, maybe not so bad. Well, I think when they initially, their initial proposal was, like, proposal was draconian. And I think yeah, that they the realized- The initial one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that, that broke tax integration so badly against corporate owners that it was just wouldn't stand, I think. And then they came up with this compromise that preserved it mostly. Yeah, yeah, the, the initial proposal was, uh, that would have been a disaster. Yeah. Uh, Quebec is another one that's- probably not so friendly, kind of goes in the opposite direction of the integration breaks that we were just talking about. In Quebec, there can be extra criteria to meet depending on the type of business you're running in order to get the SBD rate. So as an example, a professional corporation Quebec in Quebec has to have 5,500 hours of employee work per year. And that can be no more than 40 hours per week per employee. And that translates to about three or more full-time employees. And if they don't have that, then they don't get the provincial SBD. And then to make things more complicated, they do still get the federal small business rate. It's an, a, another case of a province being different from the federal uh, tax system. So the tax rate on active income ends up being, again, a hybrid rate between the full general corp rate and the full reduction of the SBD rate. And that hybrid rate is 9% federal and 11.5% provincial for a total rate of 20.5%. That's less than the full rate of 26.5%, but it introduces another wrinkle that we'll talk more about later, the corporation's ability to dispense lower taxed eligible dividends is determined off of the federal rate, not the provincial rate. So the Quebec small business owner that doesn't get the Quebec SBD pays a higher corporate tax rate overall and does not make up for it with a lower personal rate on, on dividends. So in that case, tax integration is broken quite unfavorably for the corporate owner paying themselves dividends in those cases in Quebec. Okay. So we've covered paying yourself with dividends. The alternative to using dividends to pay money out of a corporation is paying yourself in salary. And the, the, the corporation is a separate legal entity and it can employ its shareholders just like it can employ anybody else, just like any, any business out there. Uh, paying salary is generally favored by tax integration, as we've talked about it at this point in time. And it has some other potential advantages and disadvantages depending on, on how you look at it. So we're going to dive into that. Yeah, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of, of using salary because there's actually a lot there. And I will say right up front, one of the key limitations of salary is that it must be at a market rate salary. So that's usually not an issue for the an active owner. For example, a professional who is a voting shareholder for a professional corporation, they can probably pay them whatever salary they want and it, it's going to be considered reasonable if they're generating the income. However, it is important when paying a non-arm's length employee like a spouse. You cannot pay a higher salary than you would pay someone else to do the job. Uh, but still, there's some low-hanging fruit there that are pretty common, like doing some basic bookkeeping for the corporation, billing, uh, some administrative management. Some people have asked about, you know, man you know, if they have a spouse that manages their portfolio for them, they could pay them a management fee for the investments that are there. However, that brings up another important point is that you know the training and credentials of the spouse are an important factor in, in determining what's reasonable so a spouse with a financial professional designation could be paid at a higher market rate than one without any specific training and a similar example for doctors would be that you could likely pay an rn spouse more for helping around your clinic uh, than one without that qualification so i can tell you when i did this when we did this for my practice i to find out the market rate, I compared what I pay my wife uh, to billing agent fees. Uh, she also does some other administrative tasks, and I compared her salary to the pay grid for a unionized admin assistant at the university that I work at, and they get paid pretty well. So it was pretty easy mm. to find that on the university site. And uh, she also, the other thing to be aware of is when you're doing that is that you know if you're paying your spouse, they may not get extra benefits. And in the case when you're not paying extra benefits, there's a modifier in lieu of those benefits. 
So in a unionized environment, that can be pretty significant. So for us, it was a 30% higher pay rate because of, of no benefits. And I keep that university contract on file as well as the job restriction just in case I ever need to justify it. And I'm, I'm pretty careful and diligent about this, but this is also a, one of these areas that your accountant could probably give you some idea about what's considered reasonable from their experience with other incorporated clients that are probably in a different, in a similar situation to what you're in. Mark, I have an idea. Why don't you what? just ask your wife to do the CFA program so she can manage your investments and you can pay her like you'd pay a portfolio manager? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure I know how that would go down. And, and I, I think the cost of a better couch in the basement and possibly a divorce would probably outweigh the <laughs> benefits of any salary bump. I mean, she puts up with a lot with me, but I don't think that, I think that'd be crossing the line. <laughs> Okay. All right. So next thing to talk about when you're paying someone uh, as an employee, you have to pay them a, a payroll, just like you would any other employee. And then this issue of payroll taxes comes up. So when you pay a salary or a bonus, that's T4 employment income. That means you must also remit personal income tax deducted at source, just like, like any other employee would. So in this case, the source would be your corporation. And People call this payroll taxes, but really it's just paying the taxes that are owed already when someone has a salary, it's just paying them more frequently uh, rather than a, an extra tax. Now, there is is an extra tax. There's the uh, employer health tax in some provinces, but that's only for corporations with payrolls that are higher. So it's $500,000 in BC, but for most other provinces, it's in the one to $1.5 million range of payroll uh, that you might have to pay this extra employer health tax. So it won't affect most professional corporations, but it could impact some other businesses. For a small operation, though, the easiest way to handle this is, is to plan your salary for the year when you're talking with your accountant and you're deciding what your salary dividend mix is. And then you can set up automatic payments. So what we do is we set up an automatic payment of our net salary from our corporation to our personal account. So that's net of our taxes. And at the same time, we would calculate how much tax and EI if it's applicable or and CPP, which we all have to pay into, you cal to get that calculation, and we set that up as an automatic monthly payment to CRA as well. So that way we don't forget about it. It just happens automatically, the money moves, and it's very important uh, to not miss deadlines. If you do miss deadlines, there's late penalties, which can be pretty pretty significant. There's ways to try to adjust that, but but you're best off avoiding it if you can. Now, if your payroll varies monthly, then you must do it monthly. Uh, but for most of us, we can probably have something pretty consistent. And those penalties, if you are late, are stiff because CRA wants its money now and not later. And that tighter tax payment timeline uh, compared to quarterly installments or annual filing with dividends is one of the disadvantages of salary. You have to pass that tax money on faster. And in contrast, if you do uh, want to do something on short notice, it's easier to give a dividend on short notice and then sort out the taxes later than it is to adjust your payroll. So that would be a consideration for some of those one-off uh, changes. Now, the other costs that get brought up with payroll taxes aren't really taxes, and those are employment insurance and CPP, we have Canada Pension Plan contributions. Those are actually social benefit contributions, and while they're not taxes, they can behave like taxes in some cases. Uh, because not all contribu contributors stand to benefit necessarily the same way. So we'll get some yep. more detail on that one. Yeah, so one of the ones I want to talk about is is EI, employment insurance. Uh, it, it, it's often optional for the self-employed, uh, and it has pros and cons in different situations. So again, employment insurance isn't really a tax. It's a social benefits program. It's, it is insurance, as the name suggests. There's typically an employer contribution and a matching employee contribution. The main issue with self-employed business owner employees is that they're non-arm's length employees and, and not non-arm's length employees can't make claims for termination of employment. Uh, e even unrelated employees could be considered non-arm's length if they're not treated the same as other employees or are paid substantially more than, than market rates. Now, the good news for self-employed or, or non-arm's length employees EI is an opt-in option. It's not mandatory like it is for regular employees. Some people still opt in with the intention of taking parental leave or, or caregiver leave. It's funded by EI. So I, I just want to make sure it's clear that you, the, the, one of the benefits that people often use of EI is if they're terminated from their employment. 
and you get, then can collect EI while you're transitioning to a new job. That specific benefit is not available to self-employed people. And so because it's optional, a lot of people question whether it's worth it to pay into it uh, at all. But there are other benefits um, other than the unemployment situation or the termination of an employment situation. Um, so that's parental leave, and, and there are actually quite a few other care be- caregiver leave uh, benefits that can be funded by EI. The problem, though, is that once you've taken an EI claim, you cannot opt out later. So it's an opt out or an opt in initially, but once you opt in, if you take a claim, you cannot opt out later. Uh, so EI parental leave payments count for that that purpose. So if you start paying into EI with the intention of taking parental leave and then you take parental leave, you now have to pay into EI for the rest of your salary taking uh, career as a self-employed person. Um, and it, it could take multiple parental leaves for the parental uh, benefit that you get from EI to make up for the premiums that you're going to pay over the course of a career. So one of the questions that often comes up is if someone had an EI claim as an employee before they became self-employed, uh, for example, a resident physician who was being paid a salary by an employer, that, that situation does not force you into EI later on when you become self-employed. It's an opt-in when you're self-employed, and then once you take a benefit, you're, you're kind of stuck. Now, EI gets written off in a lot of cases by self-employed people. They'll just opt out sort of by, or won't opt in by, by default. But I think it's important to note that self-employed people who opt into EI only pay the employee portion of the EI premium. So that means you're paying about 40% of the cost that a non that an arm's length employee would would pay. Uh, you don't get the unemployment benefits like I mentioned, but there are six other types of special benefits available. And those are include m- maternity benefits, parental, sickness, family caregiver, and compassionate care benefits. So they're all different ways that you can get money out of the of the EI uh, insurance program. And I, I, one, one thing I want to note here is that when, when we look at the data, uh, th- those types of benefits are going to tend to be particularly beneficial for women who spend, tend to spend more time off work um, for caring for children, caring for other family members. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. Um, they, they, women tend to lose more of their lifetime earnings due to having uh, and, and caring for children and other family members than, than men do. And that's true in Canada and the U.S., uh, the other thing on EI that's kind of interesting to think about is that you always have the option to switch to paying yourself dividends. If in the future you just decided you'd, you'd opted into EI, taken the, say, parental leave benefits, and then for whatever reason you really didn't want to pay into EI anymore, you can always switch to, to dividends. Now that comes with other trade-offs, but it, it is always an option. So I think because because EI is, is uh, very interesting in the sense that th- th- there are potential benefits, but it's often... It's often sort of written off by self-employed people. We'll cover it in one of our case episodes to walk through a couple of examples where it may or may not make sense in a given situation. Yeah, it can help in, in different ways. And it, it, it's interesting when we were writing this episode, This I had, I had actually written off EI as well. And uh, I'm now, I mean, in retrospect, reconsidering that was a, whether that was a great idea, idea or not, because one of the other things that may happen later on in your career is you're going to end up paying dividends mostly anyways, which we'll right. talk about in our compensation episode. So this, you know, with the part with the lower premiums, the potential benefits, and then your the fact you may switch to dividends at some point anyways, really kind of changes the math uh, on this one. So we're going to get into that into a case. It's going to be cool. Yep. Now, the other thing that, that causes a lot of consternation is Canada Pension Plan payments in, or CPP. So, so this is deducted from payroll it's the CPP contributions, and some people think of it as a tax because they're forced to pay it. And in some ways, it looks like a tax. However, according to that logic, I mean, unionized employees can be forced to pay into their pension plan and probably wouldn't consider that necessarily a tax either. That's one of those pensions that we're probably jealous of. I mean, it, the difference is that this is a, it's a compulsory government-mandated contributory pension plan, just like some of those other pension plans. But the fact that it's related uh, to the government sometimes gives people pause, but it's actually managed on its own. And if you look at it, it's actually, in fact, a defined benefit pension. It's indexed to inflation. There's survivor benefits. There's disability benefits and a death benefit. So this is actually a pretty good pension uh, in terms of the benefits that you're getting. And I would say that it, it's important to know that an inflation index pension is one of the few 
true risk-free assets for long-term investors to preserve their buying power and mitigate all of the different risks that come over long time frames. It's very hard to find anymore, and CPP is one of the few ways that Canadians can actually access this type of asset. It's the kind of pension that people often get jealous over. I mean, the difference here is that it's relatively small. And as I mentioned, there's that it's government mandated, which always changes how people think about things sometimes. I, I would say generally probably not for good reason that, that it makes people nervous. I, I think it is, it's a well-funded and well-run pension. It's, it's uh, well regarded around the world in, in terms of the model that they use to, to manage the, the investments. Now, CBP is a huge topic. Uh, it, it's important though to, to bring up and, and, and I think important to really understand because it can materially affect the salary versus dividends decision for business owners. I've seen many yep. t tax advisors or self-employed people say, that I, I don't want to take salary because I don't want to pay into CPP as if CPP is an additional tax. And if you think about it that way, that as a, as a tax that you're not going to get any benefit from, then it can make salary look a lot worse than dividends, which I think feeds into that, that common, uh, uh, common idea that dividends are better than, than salary. So big topic, but for now, we just want to leave listeners with a message that CPP is probably not something that you want to avoid paying into in, in most cases. There are some specific situations where it doesn't make sense to, to pay into CPP, but generally speaking, um, it, it's actually something that you should want to pay into because the benefit is very attractive. It's not a tax. Um, now, we're not just going to leave it there permanently and tell you to <laughs> trust us. Um, we've actually got a whole, a whole separate episode solely dedicated to uh, diving into how CPP works for for business owners, including the total after-tax cost of contributing, which is a lot lower than people realize, and uh, and and why it's beneficial to have this type of asset in your overall retirement mix. Oh yeah, I mean the, this this episode turned started out as being an episode, and then it bloomed into us doing different analyses that people hadn't looked at, and yeah. and, and multiple episodes. We're going to do a whole episode on that when you've done some really neat analysis there. And there's all sorts of tax credit nuances that make CPP look an even better deal. So. It's going to be a great episode. So we will come back to that. One of the things that one of the tax credits that I'll I'll mention now, which is important for when you're considering the salary versus dividend debate, is is the Canada Employment Tax Credit. And you know, since we're talking about all these nuances, and this is one of the ways that salary rather than dividend and only compensation strategy helps incorporated business owners. Now, the Canada Employment Tax Credit is small. It's a fifteen percent tax credit on up to. $1,368 of income. So it only works out to be about 200 bucks. However, that just further moves things towards favoring salary. And it's also something that self-employed people who are not incorporated cannot usually access. They're excluded, but if you're an employee of a corporation, you can use it, even if you own the corporation. So I thought that was pretty cool. And th this was including in the modeling the CPP that you did. So we'll unpack that in that episode, but it helps to reduce the cost of contributing to CPP to be less than what we think it is. And another interesting idea for those that, you know, even after they listen to that episode, they're like, oh, I'm never going to contribute to CPP. You could actually pay $3,500 in salary and not have to pay, make CPP contributions. And that's enough to help you get this employment tax credit. So there's all sorts of little tax ninja moves that you can you can learn here. So I, I just couldn't resist giving some of those tidbits, but there's going to be a whole episode on that. Yeah, no, I, I love that stuff. I love the tidbits. I, I, I think it, it's it's almost it's like it's it's not that CPPs like if we take the employment tax credit um, tax credit example, it it doesn't make CPP less expensive. Well, it's it sort of does. It, it, it's it's more like it makes dividends more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> paying dividends to avoid paying into CPP gets more expensive when you account for stuff like this. Yeah, I guess it, it, it effectively makes CPP cheaper, sort of, but it's happening on, on both on both sides. If you compare the two alternatives side by side, CPP is less costly than people tend to think it is, and paying dividends in order to avoid CPP is more costly than people tend to think it is. Yeah, and that's the relevant question. Right, exactly, because that is the alternative. The alternative is you don't pay into CPP and retain the money in your corporation, how much better or worse is that? That's that's what we'll talk about in that episode. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Uh, the, the other thing that's really important with salary is that it, it can create other planning benefits. It, it, it comes with other planning benefits, financial planning benefits. Um, having tax sheltered account room to grow your money 
and, and then multiple accounts to plan your, your drawdown in retirement is advantageous. We talked about that in, in past episodes, diversifying your tax exposures through different account types. Using salary, paying yourself in salary uh, instead of dividends uh, allows for the creation of room in RRSPs and IPPs, individual pension plans. That's something that you don't get if you're only paying yourself in dividends. So we talked about this in episode eight, you get 18% of your T4 income as RSP room each year up to an, an annual maximum and contributions to the RSP are 100% deductible against personal income and then salary is deductible to the, to the corporation. So the RSP offers more tax deferral than retaining earnings in a corporation since you're not paying corporate tax or personal tax upfront plus the invested money in the RSP account then grows tax-free, which is pretty attractive. Corporate investment income can be pretty tax efficient uh, when you manage the refundable taxes. But if you're not able to, to recoup those refundable taxes, the corporate tax rate can, can get pretty, pretty high for investments. But in either case, there's less tax drag in an RSP than there is in, a, in even an efficient corporation. Now you do eventually pay income tax on the RSP in retirement as you draw the money out of the RSP, either as RSP withdrawals or when it converts to a RIF and you have to start taking withdrawals out of, out of the, the RIF uh, over time. Hopefully, ideally at a lower tax rate than when you contribute it, which results in an additional, what I would call a, a bonus or an additional benefit. And that's that sort of difference between the contribution and withdrawal tax rate. Now, one potentially important advantage of this type of income compared to using dividends from a corporation is that it's not grossed up for the purpose of calculating income tested benefits uh, like OAS and, and GIS. Uh, so that's another. And we also mentioned the, the Canada Child Benefit as well, the CCB. So those, those clawbacks can be uh, much worse where, where they, they happen much more quickly with uh, dividend income than, than salary due to the, due to the gross ups. Uh, so that can be a problem that that's at least worth considering. Um, yeah. So that's uh, potentially a benefit of salaries is that, that there's no gross up. Yeah. I mean, this, this gets to the point that, yeah, you can look at your taxes one year at a time, but you really need to think about how you're planning your corporation over your lifetime and, and decisions you make now are going to impact what's going to happen down the road in the future. So preferably you've thought about that in advance and, you know, we've talked about RRIFs, but the other option also be, an IPP, which could give you, and either of those actually give you the pension tax credit, which is this 15% tax credit on the first $2,000 of pension income each year after the age of 65. So again, there's another advantage towards edge salary there, even though it's a few hundred bucks, but it just keeps tipping the scales. Now we'll, we'll say also that after the age of 65, it becomes a little bit less important uh, what you've done because you can pension split, you can dividend split from the corporation. But if you do retire earlier than that, having built up a spousal RSP is another way to help income split. And that could help your household plan before the age of 65, but you have to plan that in advance. And another related option that keeps that salary keeps the door open to, as I mentioned, was these IPPs. And they accumulate room different from RSPs. And we're going to talk more about that when we get into pensions in, the, in a future episode. But their contribution room depends on having paid salary from your corporation. There's an actuarial calculation to determine the contributions that you can make. And as you get a bit older, that becomes a, bit, a way to shelter much more money uh, than you would with an RRSP, depending on how that all works out. And that, But that's heavily impacted on how much salary you've paid yourself from your corporation, both in the current year or when you're starting to contribute to something like an IPP, but also all the previous years too, because your corporation can buy back those previous years of service uh, based on the salary that's paid, not dividends. So pensions, RIFs, all those things, credit, they also have some other uh, advantages like uh, potentially creditor protection and that using a corporation alone to invest may not necessarily provide that to you. So there's lots of ways that these these options are favored. Yeah. So I think to, to kind of wrap up on on this, redirecting some money from the corporation to an RSP and or an IPP if you need salary to live on anyway, it can be pretty advantageous. Uh, there's more tax deferral, tax sheltering. There's no gross up for determining income tested benefits like OAS and GIS. Uh, and there are some tax credits specific to salary and potential creditor protection using RSP and IPP 
uh, account types that may not exist with a with a corporation on its own. And then the final point I'd make here about the advantage of taking some salary is that people and institutions understand salary. And this might seem like a, a funny reason, but it's but it's a real thing. I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Lenders tend to have an easier time understanding salary income, which makes it easier to access financing. Like if you want to take out a a, a mortgage, uh, disability insurance is another one where it, it's easier to get disability insurance on salary income. Some insurers will insure based on corporate income, and likewise, some lenders will will insure based on uh, corporate income or or dividends if you can show that they're consistent. But in general, um, insurers and lenders are just happier to see T four salary income. Yeah, and I think that extends to a lot of other things too, like the average voter understands salary and the benefits that go with it. So when there are legislative changes, they're more likely to target those using dividends rather than salary. And we saw that in COVID. Uh, there were there payroll subsidies and other rescue measures that were put in place, and they were much easier to access if mm. you'd been using a payroll and not just dividends. I mean, initially it was only payroll for some of them. Uh, and we've also seen it with the legislative nuances that are already in place, like tax credits, creditor protection. These rules are designed with salary in mind. If you And if you're thinking about risk for the future and legislation, having paid some salary uh, is probably going to be more protected against that when whatever changes come than having just left everything in a corporation. Okay, so that's getting towards some of the other practical planning parts, which are going to bridge us into our next episode. So I did say in the intro to this episode, one of the biggest advantages of a corporation is being is being able to regulate this cash flow from your business into your personal hands like a giant dam. So the business income flows into the reservoir. You can decide how to flow it out as salary or dividends. and But you can regulate not only how it flows out, you can regulate the rate at which that money flows out. And that regulation of the rate is what we call income smoothing and smoothing out that income uh, could be very advantageous so let's say you're not incorporated and you had years of very high income much of that would get taxed in very high or even the highest personal tax bracket and unfortunately you don't make up for that in other years when your income is lower so tax rates increase dramatically with increasing income not linearly and personal income is taxed in the year that it's received. It can't be shifted forward and backwards through time uh, like you can do that with a corporation. So it's kind of like with the dam analogy, it's like a river that overflows its banks. And the excess water that flow, overflows those banks is absorbed by the surrounding soil. And in this case, it's like parched, cracked soil that has this unlimited ability to just permanently absorb money. And in droughty years, you can't get that water back again. So it's a kind of a one-way movement into the tax system, and then it's gone. Now, with a corporation, you can reserve some of that water in your big reservoir uh, when you have excess from the wet years. And instead of having that spill into the parched dirt, you keep it there. And then you can allow it out to try to irrigate during the dry years. So you more efficiently move that money out well without overflowing the tax banks uh, of your personal consumption. So basically, you smooth it out of across years using a corporation. It'll overall keep yourself in lower tax brackets over your lifetime. So not just over the short term, but you want to think about this in the long term. It helps to absorb these fluctuations, not only in chunky income going up and down, but also big chunky expenses. So both sides of that equation. And I don't think I can overemphasize the, how the big the impact of this is in real life. So I've got I've got this data sheet where I've tracked my income and expenses over my entire career. And I know we've hit some pretty dense material on corporations, but even if you leave your compensation planning completely to your accountant, if you don't discuss your planning, spending plan and make an income smoothing plan, you're going to leave a lot more taxes along the way. And I can tell you when I started actually paying attention to this, it was only in sort of around 2017-ish that I started to pay attention. Other than that, I really didn't pay attention to any of this. But when I started paying attention to it, our tax bills dropped pretty dramatically. And I'd say that even my income stayed about the same or overall consumption rose. But by understanding this stuff and discussing it with our accountant and making plans, we just cut our tax rates pretty dramatically. Yep. Yeah, super, super, super important to, to think about this stuff in a with a long-term, long-term view. Yep. 
uh, the, the, a big ebb and flow of, of income is, is super common in, in business. I mean, any, anyone who's listening who's in business and, and has, a, has a corporation is going to understand that. Uh, there can be booms and there can also be busts. And if your business is in a relatively stable industry, like a uh, medical practice, that still can be, that still can be the case. I've seen it with, uh, I've seen it with many, many clients. Uh, outside of economic cycles, you may also have years of low income for personal reasons. Like if you take time off due to an illness or a parental leave or a, or a sabbatical. So a corporation can be super useful to smooth out income, uh, regardless of your business type, because there can be uh, economic or, 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 uh, personal or non-personal reasons why your why your income fluctuates so it makes it applicable to to everyone who has a corporation uh, for example if you have if you make three hundred thousand dollars one year and no money the next year with a with a corporation you could pay yourself one hundred and fifty thousand dollars each year now that makes a big difference in the overall taxes paid over those two years because of the progressive personal tax rate system that we have in Canada if we take that example in Ontario at 2024 tax rates, if you're not incorporated, you'd pay about $117,000 in taxes for that, that high income year and then no tax for the second year for the, for the no income year. If you smooth that income out over two years using a corporation, that $150,000 per year would result in $42,000 of tax each year for a total of $84,000. So that is a savings of $33,000 in tax by smoothing the flow of income out over over a couple of years. Yeah. Um, and then this, you, you can use the same type of planning for big chunky spends. So when I mentioned long-term thinking earlier and, and really having a plan for, for future spending, um, it, it doesn't really matter if you're already spending so much that you draw money in the top, top tax bracket every year, that, that, that this type of planning doesn't matter. But if you normally consume at a lower level, then planning for big spending in the future can save you a lot on personal taxes by keeping you out of the higher brackets yeah it's like for example if i were planning a hundred and fifty thousand dollar luxury item in three years like a luxury car or an rv didn't you mention taylor swift tickets earlier yeah that would be a big luxury item too could be a big <laughs> surprise splurge you know yeah so let's say you have this big splurge of a hundred and fifty thousand dollars and normally you spend eighty thousand dollars a year so i could plan to take a bit of extra money out of the corporation each year and save towards that purchase Instead of, you know, taking out the minimum for two years and then having this maxima, this massive amount come out in year three. So uh, using those numbers in Ontario to fund $80,000 of consumption a year plus $150,000 splurge could look like this, roughly. So $111,000 a year salary for two years. And then in that third year for the splurge, if you didn't plan, $415,000 uh, to have the required after-tax money uh, to fund your usual living plus whatever exciting thing that you're going to buy. So in total, you'd pay about $247,000 in tax and CPP to do that. Now, in contrast, if you were to smooth that out over three years, so you're planning this instead, it would be $203,000 a year of salary to fund your $80,000 a year of consumption plus have $50,000 a year of after-tax money that you're putting aside for this upcoming expense. So this is hard for people to wrap their heads around because they're paying a bit more tax up front. But over the course of those three years, because you're planning your total personal tax bill would only be $219,000. So that's a tax savings of $28,000 with the you know, same overall income, overall consumption, but you save $28,000 by planning it. And this really emphasizes why this concept is important. You know, along with planning for your big spends, even if your accountant is helping you to plan, uh, they may not give you an income smoothing plan if you don't discuss your future cash flow needs with them. I mean, for some, the adv advice is just the default to just leaving money in the corporation, taking out the minimum each year, but you know that's not optimal in this case. And even if they are savvy enough to help you smooth your income, they can't do that if you don't talk to them about what your plans are. So you have to understand what what the importance of this is and try to plan as much as you can now if you do have unexpected big spans that you didn't plan for that's going to happen happens all the time happens to us quite a bit but i mean don't don't despair about that i mean there are other options that you can use to smooth income on short notice uh like a shareholder loan would be a good example yeah i, I will talk about shareholder loans i, I do want to just comment on 
the, the idea of, of communicating your spending plan with, with your accountant, um, it's not that accountants don't do this and it's not that individuals can't do it on their own, but I, I, I do think that financial planning specifically as a, as a discipline has a big focus on identifying what your goals are, looking at your overall assets, looking at your long-term plan, looking at your cash flow needs and, and making that type of plan. So I think that there is a distinction there in terms of the type of advice that you would expect to get from a financial planner versus an accountant. Now, again, people can definitely sit down and map that stuff out on their own, uh, but it is something that a financial planner, a good financial planner should should focus on. So in a lot of cases, the way that I've thought about it, the way that I've observed it, and again, it's not to say that accountants never do this, but accountants will tend to look at how do I optimize things for this tax year, maybe the next two tax years. But a financial planner is looking over your your lifetime over the next 30, year, 30 or, or more years. Like we talked about earlier, your time horizon doesn't end at retirement. So a financial planner might be looking at a, at a 60 or 70 year time horizon right through to your making your, your estate efficient. And that just brings a very different type of thinking than how do I optimize for this, this, one, uh, this one tax year. Yep. yep. That's why this whole series of podcasts is important. You have to have these conversations with the different members of your team to actually get the value that you can unlock from them. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then a financial planner, you you take the concepts from a financial planner, or maybe the financial planner is talking to your accountant. And then together there's a combination of the longer term thinking. And then how do we optimize that in each specific tax year over, over time? And I think that's where you start to get really significant, uh, significant benefits. Oh yeah. And it compounds just like everything else. For sure. Yeah. And some of it's, some of it is, is much harder to do in, in the future. Like we talked about creating RSP room is something that just doesn't happen later. But also if you realize right now you have this large expense, uh, it's kind of hard to fix. Yeah. Although shareholder loans, which I'll talk about now are are one way to, (laughs) one way to fix it. Yeah. Uh, so if a shareholder takes money out of a corporation without designated, designating it as salary or a dividend, that is a shareholder loan. Uh, a shareholder loan is super quick and flexible, a way to take money out of a corporation, but it has to be used very carefully. And I'll, I'll talk about why. If you use your corporate bank account to make a personal purchase, that's a shareholder loan. If it's a non-business person per- purchase, um, a, a shareholder can take funds out of a corporation without incurring personal taxes as long as the loan is repaid within one year from the corporation's year end. So that means if a corporation has a December 31st year end and you take funds out in June, 2024, the loan has to be repaid by December 31st, 2025. Now, if the loan's not repaid, it can be a bit ugly. So this is why I say this is a tool you've got to be careful with. Even when you repay the loan on time, there is a deemed interest benefit at CRA's prescribed interest rate, which is 6% at the time of recording. If a shareholder loan is not repaid on time though, the borrowed funds are then included in personal income and they cannot be deducted. The amount cannot be deducted from corporate income. So there's double tax on those funds. Now there is a personal deduction available when the loan is eventually repaid, um, but still, still not ideal. To avoid that tax situation, that nasty tax situation, you can repay the shareholder loan on time uh, or you can book the amount as salary or dividend before the loan becomes taxable. And that makes it a little bit a little bit better. Uh, the other way that people can get themselves into trouble with shareholder loans is by trying to do this regularly instead of paying normal compensation. If there's a pattern of loans and repayments that CRA would view, uh, then CRA would view the original loan as not being repaid on time. And that triggers the double taxation penalty that, that I mentioned. And it can go right back to the start of the original loan if it's a, if it's a series of loans. That's how, how CRA would, uh, would view it. Um, the classic scenario for this is someone gives himself a shareholder loan, repays it from a line of credit or personal money just before it's due, and then takes the money back out as a shareholder loan the following fiscal year. Uh, it's basically a, a shareholder loan given and then repaid each year to avoid paying taxable income, but CRA doesn't like that. Yeah, no, that's a nah, bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are some ways that you can get money out of the corporation quite efficiently, efficiently that are excellent ideas, and one of those is uh, to use your capital dividend account. And this is another way that you can get it out on relatively short notice. It can't be immediate because you do have to do some filing and and, and make some arrangements, but you can get a big uh, chunk of money out potentially without having a big personal income tax bump by using your capital dividend account. So we've talked a bit about it before, but your corporation, when it realizes capital gains, the excluded half of that capital gains is not subject to tax. 
And that's tracked by one of these notional accounts, so just on paper for taxes, called the CDA or the Capital Dividend Account. Now, if your corporation has a positive balance in that CDA, it can pay out a non-taxable capital dividend, so it's tax-free. It does require filing a special election, so it can take a few weeks to do that. There's some accounting fees that go with it. However, if you have a positive balance and a personal cash flow needs, uh, then this can be a great way uh, to move money out to meet that. Uh, if you don't have a large positive CDA balance, but you're sitting on a bunch of capital gains in liquid securities, then harvesting some of those gains to get money into the CDA is another strategy that you could consider using on somewhat short notice. And by harvesting, what I mean is that you sell the security and then you immediately rebuy it. So it's kind of like the mirror image of tax loss selling, except there's there's no superficial gains rule. So you can sell it, realize that capital gain, buy the identical security immediately without a problem. So, and, and that that's important because there's three implications to doing that in a corporation, even though it can take you literally five minutes on a computer uh, with a discount brokerage to execute the trades, but there are implications from that. First is you shouldn't miss much time in the markets if you immediately rebuy it, you know, maybe a few minutes, mm -hmm. but there are still going to be some transaction costs. So there'll be a trading commission, which hopefully is free or not much money, but there's also the bid ask spread, which is hidden in there. Again, if it's a liquid security, it shouldn't be very big. It should be a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Uh, so the second implication is that the included half of the capital gain would be considered to be passive income. So that's taxed in the corporation and accounts towards those passive income limits that we've spent a lot of time talking about, which could be good or bad depending on your province. Uh, it, it have that impact on the active income. So, and then the third thing to be, to be aware of is that uh, you get that excluded half to the CDA, which then is this big benefit that we've potentially got to move it out. So the personal tax savings of using that tax-free capital dividend instead of regular income like salary or taxable dividends could offset those corporate taxes quite easily. So the corporate tax on the on the capital gain should be quite small and the potential tax savings compared to salary or dividends uh, regularly is, is quite large. Now, the, the math usually works out, but you definitely want to discuss this for your specific situation with your accountant. It's, again, an example where you can help yourself by being an educated client of bringing it up. You know, there's a lot of times I know people have needed the money. They've talked to their accountant about that who hadn't brought it up, and they usually pause for a second and go, yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't we do that? So this is one of the things knowing it and bringing it up can really help you. So I have actually written about this on the Looney Doctor blog, uh, and we'll come back to this idea in other episodes, but it's definitely worth mentioning repeatedly because it's very powerful and it's not a well-known strategy and it's very often overlooked I mean, we've used it to buy an rv to bridge finance a move uh, we bought a hot tub after episode one of the podcast kind of on on a on short notice we've used our capital <laughs> dividend account for all those things <laughs> yeah so that, i think that the cd is a, is a big benefit uh, when when used well and and before we leave the the topic of the cda um, th th this came up because we were talking about planning for a, a splurge and smoothing income for that. But it's important to know that even if you're in steady state spending, you have a lar if, if you have a large enough CDA balance to justify the accounting costs, which could be a few hundred to, to a thousand dollars, if depending on the accountant, the sooner that you use the, your CDA, the better. Uh, the CDA is, we talked about this earlier with, uh, with refundable taxes, I think, or, or, or grip as well. Yeah. Uh, but it's priced in nominal dollars. Uh, so the buying power that, that the CDA represents erodes over time. So even if you don't have a big splurge, using your CDA and then reducing some of your regular taxable income uh, can also be worth discussing with your with your accountant as part of your overall compensation plan. Uh, interacts with all kinds of other stuff because you might want to be taking salary for other reasons like gaining RSP room. You might want to be taking uh, taxable dividends for triggering refundable taxes. Uh, so it all has to be balanced together. But if you have CDA available, it's definitely, I would say, generally going to be a good idea to to use that to take money out of the corporation uh, to a shareholder tax free. So we will we will circle back on this and all those trade offs when and how they interact when we do episodes on optimal compensation and tax planning. But the CDA is is a really really valuable 
account. And, and I know because I've seen it. I know you have too, Mark. There are people sitting on large CDA balances, in some cases, very large, yeah. and not realizing that their utility is eroding. So I think the more we the more we flag this idea of, hey, if you have a CDA balance, you should use it, the better. Oh, yeah. And I think what people don't realize, too, is because it's so valuable, it erodes really, really quickly. Right. It's out of all the notional accounts, inflation erodes that buying power very fast. And Okay, the last point about CDA for real, I mean it, is, is that in addition for it's important for spending, the CDA is twice as powerful for giving and donating to to secure, to secure uh, charities. So if you donate appreciated securities from a corporation to a registered charity, not only does that get rid of the tax liability of that capital gain, which you would have at some point, it's about you know 25% tax for a corporation, the, but also the full donation amount gives the deduction against income. And this could be pretty cool. Depending on your situation, that could even be a deduction against investment income, which is usually taxed at 50%. So you remove a half half rate tax liability, can apply it against a full rate tax liability. And that's not that's not it. It actually gets better too. Like the whole capital gain, not just the excluded half, the whole capital gain gets credited to your CDA. So it has it doubles the potential amount that you can move out as a tax-free capital dividend. Now, those three features are sometimes called the triple benefit of donating using a corporation. It's it's huge. And so if you are charitably inclined, then this would be a way to not only give to charity, but either give more to charity or give some to charity and move money out to yourself more tax efficiently. And the final point I'd make, which just kind of came up recently, is it's worth mentioning that the new changes to the ultimate alternative minimum tax rules, uh, which apply to individuals, and they actually have some kind of nasty wrinkles in there for really high income individuals that are donating personally uh, to charity, uh, but it doesn't apply to corporations. So that's yet another reason why donating appreciated stock via corporation is probably you know the best way to do it. Yeah, the appreciated stock donation from a corporation, I would say, is generally underappreciated. Mm-hmm. It's pretty attractive. Oh, yeah. um, okay, so the, the final concept we want to introduce in this episode about paying yourself from a corporation is income splitting. We touched on the concept of in, income splitting when we talked about spousal RSPs in, in episode eight and, and again in this episode. And when we talked about the attribution rules and taxable accounts in episode nine. So we'll come back to some of the specific strategies in a more comprehensive way as we do our optimal compensation and tax planning episodes. But using a corporation is one of the other ways to potentially split income, share the t- income tax burden across multiple people in a, in a household. Um, so the, the, the idea behind income splitting is that you want to even out the taxable income between spouses or common law partners or potentially other, other family members in Canada Income t- is, is income is taxed individually. So two households with the same household income can have radically different tax burdens depending on who how, how that income is distributed across across people in the household. So for for example, we'll take an Ontario household with uh, three hundred thousand dollars of income, all earned by one partner. They're going to pay around one hundred fourteen thousand dollars in tax. So they've got one hundred eighty six thousand dollars of of after tax income to spend. If the same household income were split evenly between two partners, the tax bill is a much smaller $83,000. So that is a $31,000 difference in household buying power for the same household income, the same pre-tax household income. And that's just achieved by splitting income between two partners. So pretty attractive if you can if you can do it. There are lots of ways that the government tries to avoid uh, having household split income, but with a corporation, there are a couple of ways that it, it can be done. So the first one, that's available to all business owners, whether they're incorporated or not, uh, is to hire and pay a spouse or, or another family member a market rate salary for work that they do for the business. So as we mentioned earlier, it, it, might, it has to be legitimate work uh, and it has to be paid at a rate that you would pay a third party. Mark, you talked through how you've justified the amount that you pay your wife, which I think is, is really important for people to understand. You can't just pick a number. Uh, if you have a business where you both really contribute materially, it makes income splitting with salary super easy. Uh, I mean, we've seen this with, at, at PWL, we've seen this with dual physician households. It becomes pretty easy to, to split income in that case, which should be obvious, I guess. Yeah. Um, now, this has the benefit of, of splitting 
income plus all the advantages of, of salary that we that we mentioned earlier. The main limitation on salary for income splitting, again, is that it has to be market rate. So unless you're going to go and tell your wife to do the CFA program, which <laughs> I agree, Mark, I, I would not do that either. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it ends up li- limiting many professionals with a lower income spouse to paying um, salary for some basic admin admin work that you could justify as as uh, as being done without any need for for special certifications or knowledge. Yeah. Before we leave that topic, I would say there are some advantages to having someone who has skin in the game, double checking your billing and your books. You know, like for our, in our medical practice, we routinely bill probably about ten percent more than some of my peers that I've discussed this with, and I think it's largely because we don't miss much. And my wife's pretty tenacious about it she handles it and <laughs> she's tenacious to me about it usually and and the, the reason why this comes up is like as physicians we often have multiple ways to bill for doing exactly the same thing but the higher paying route usually requires better documentation and information collection which you should be doing anyways but there's that extra layer which people just don't bother so it's good to have that accountability uh, from someone to make sure that you're doing it and then one other practical issue that comes up with hiring a a spouse is the payroll which we've talked about you must actually put them on your payroll and pay them along with cpp and the other remittances just like any other employee if your spouse works outside the corporation that could get into one little wrinkle and in that there is a potential for a little bit more employer cpp paid than otherwise would be the case so you'd be paying some from your corp some cpp would be paid from whoever the other employer was and that happens because individuals get credited for the ex for excess cpp payments uh, but employers do not so there is a potential there if you have a employee spouse who also works outside of the corporation uh, for someone else that you might have a little bit more of a corporate expense although i think a lot of the benefits still probably outweigh uh, that issue it does in our case we actually have pretty good uh, income Hmm. And the other thing that gets people in trouble is if you treat them, if you want to try to treat them as a non-employee vendor and people try to do that because they just don't want to put them on the payroll. They don't want to worry about any of the, you know, the hassle that goes with that. They don't want to have to pay into CPP and have these issues. CRA is likely to take offense to that. This is one of the ways that people get themselves in trouble and they're not going to consider them to be an independent vendor unless they're providing, providing either a variety of services uh, to, and, and lots of service to other companies just than yours. So the only people that they provide service to is your corporation and most, and not much to anybody else. It's probably going to be considered to be an employee relationship and they yeah. want to get those payroll remittances. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's income splitting with, uh, with, with salary. The other way that a business can income split is using dividends. Now, this one is only available to a corporation. Income splitting with salary can be done without a corporation, as I mentioned earlier. The family member that you want to dividend split with has to be a shareholder of the corporation. So it has, you have to have a corporation in place, and the, the family member receiving dividend income has to be a shareholder. You have to be a shareholder to receive a dividend from a corporation. For professional corporations, that would usually be as a non-voting shareholder. Uh, when the corporation is formed, each family member gets their own class of shares in the company. And that way your corporation can declare a different dividend amount for each shareholder separately uh, to facilitate income splitting. So that is the power of dividends. The amount of a dividend does not have to correlate to anything, unlike a salary. It doesn't have to be a market rate. There is no market rate because it's a dividend. Um, So if you have a spouse who does does some admin work and that's worth $20,000 a year, if you were to hire someone uh, at a market rate, you can only pay them $20,000 in salary. But if your but your corporation could give them a hundred thousand dollar or two hundred thousand dollar dividend if they wanted to, so the advantage of, of that uh, in, enabling you to, to perfectly income split using dividends is pretty obvious. It's so obvious, in fact, that the federal government targeted that type of income splitting with a, a special tax called tax on split income or or TOSI, the TOSI rules. And those rules punish dividends given to inactive non-voting shareholders by taxing them at the highest personal rates. So theoretically, you could use dividends to income split infinitely, but that theory doesn't work out because of the TOSI, the TOSI yeah. rules. Yeah, not anymore. Those TOSI rules killed dividend splitting as a strategy for many, many people. Uh, however, it is important to note that there are some still, still some important exceptions. 
So if exempt, and that's the language that you use, if exempt, then dividends can be given in any amount and taxed at the usual personal rates. Now, like most legislation, it's pretty complicated. And they also used it to specifically target certain groups, which is why it's so complicated. And they didn't want to catch up others. So the intended target for this was incorporated professionals. And for example, businesses that deliver or derive less than 90% of their income from services and carry an inventory that they sell separate from their services may be exempt from TOSI. The, that exemption can even fluctuate on a yearly basis. So CRA gives the example of a plumber that provides services but also sells retail parts. And in years when over 10% of the gross income is from selling parts, uh, they can income split the dividends. But in other years, when over 90% of the gross income comes from unclogging pipes and toilets and all that kind of stuff, they can't income split. So services get them into trouble. So there could be good years or crappy years for the plumber uh, to income split, or maybe it's maybe it's the other way around. Yeah, it's definitely complicated. Uh, but there are more than uh, just some some plumber cracks in the in the TOSI rules. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the non-services business exemption is not going to be uh, most professional corporations, there are a couple of common exemptions that, that may apply. One is if the corporation's active shareholders over the age of 65, the corporation owners can split income in retirement, similar to how pensioners have that option. And that was specifically put in place for that reason, because people with corporations were saying, you're blowing up our retirement plan. Why do people who have pensions get to do this when we don't? And so it was, uh, it was allowed. I remember, remember yeah. when all that happened. Uh, the, the other big exemption is if the shareholder spouse plays an active role in, in the business. Uh, CRA has defined an active role in the business with a bright line test of 20 hours per week of work for the corporation during the times that it is, is in operation. And, and the time that it's in operation is important for companies with a seasonal business, like a landscape, landscaping company that takes the winters off. Or in, in the literature, they give, um, they give the example of a, of a farmer. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm honestly not sure how CRA would interpret businesses that choose to open and close for small blocks mm. of time. Like a seasonal business is one thing, but I, I know that where I grew up, many businesses electively shut down during hunting season. And, you know, the rules are fairly new and there's some gray zones that are in there that haven't been extensively tested yet. So, I mean, you would definitely want to have the timesheet and payroll evidence of employment to show that you exceed the bar. That's what CRA talks about. But there are some other important nuances there too. One is that that 20 hour per week rule allows for exemption of dividends issued in the same year. So that could be important for newer businesses. You know, if you just started up and there that you meet that rule and it's your first year, you could, you could meet the threshold. Uh, it could also happen for businesses that have kind of sporadic spouse employee involvement. So some years they work a lot, some years they don't. But it becomes important because what happens is, is that you become exempt in perpetuity once there's a total of five years of meeting that bright line 20 hour per week test. And that's five years in total, not necessarily continuously sequential. So we just touched on a couple of the TOSI rules. The TOSI rules are very complex and the specific facts to each situation is really important. So it's definitely one of those areas to get professional tax advice from a CPA who's well-versed in the TOSI rules uh, before you're considering some sort of income splitting strategy. And the other thing that is important to be aware of us too is there's always the issue of the general anti-avoidance rule, which is kind of like the, the big nasty tiger that CRA keeps chained in its closet to threaten people with. You know, so if you have a strategy that is actually within the rules of TOSI, but they decide that it's been put in place just for the purpose of income splitting, then then they have the threat of unleashing the gar tiger, uh, which comes with all sorts of penalties. Uh, I was hoping you would roar. <laughs> this podcast is just full of firsts. <laughs> <laughs> they did just, the gar just got strengthened. Um, yeah. in terms of when it can apply, like the, the new GAR rules that, that, um, that were, were just put in place are, are they're, they're pretty intimidating. So it's, yeah. a, it's a scary tiger. It really is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely worth being aware of. Uh, okay. So I, I, I think we got into all of the, the nooks and crannies of, of different ways that, that you can compensate yourself from your business in the next episodes. We're going to talk about optimizing that, which is a, a whole other interesting thing to think about. 
Uh, but for now, let's let's go to our our post op debrief for uh, for a recap. All right. So in this episode, we covered some of the nuts and bolts about how to pay yourself using a corporation. A corporation is a powerful tool to smooth out your business cash flow into your personal hands. And that helps to decrease the amount lost to, to Canada's progressive personal tax system. Yeah, that uh, income smoothing works well in the short term. You can smooth out high income and low income years. If your business income fluctuates due to market forces or personal circumstances, it also works on the consumption side as well. So with some planning, you can smooth how you take personal income from the corporation to, for upcoming big chunky spends. And importantly, that requires you to think ahead and to communicate with your accountant and your financial planners. Yeah, definitely. If you get caught unprepared, there could be some shorter notice options like using a shareholder loan or a capital gains harvest to get money out. Neither is a substitute for <clears throat> for an emergency buffer like a line of credit or some savings because they do require some discussion and planning to and, and time to execute properly. Yeah, and in addition to that short term, regulating cash flow through a corporation can help smooth your income and keep you in lower tax brackets over your lifetime as well. So effectively shifting income and deferring taxes on that from your high earning years to retirement where your income may be lower. And that underpins the notion of corporate tax deferred investing that we discussed in episode nine. And it's going to be peppered throughout the future episodes on tax and estate planning. And in addition to income splitting, a corporation can help to lower a household's tax bill. Oh, <laughs> oops. We're in the home stretch here. Yeah. <laughs> in addition to income smoothing, a corporation can help to lower a household's tax bill through income splitting. And that could be using some salary, a strategy available to any business, including a non-incorporated one, or using dividends, which is something that's only, only available to an incorporated business. There are rules to prevent too much dividend splitting, called the TOSI rules. The main opportunities for shareholders playing an active role in the business uh, or, or when, when the active voting shareholder is over 65. In those cases, dividend splitting will be allowed. Yeah, we also covered the practical implications of using salary and dividends, the two main ways to pay yourself from a corporation. Salary is generally favored by tax integration, has the advantage of creating tax sheltered RSP or IPP room, and the advantages that come from being something that most of the voting population gets. So there's uh, implications to that. There are also some tax credits and other perks that come with, with salary. With salary, you have to pay into CPP. That's often used as a reason to not pay salary uh, by, by those pushing a dividend only income strategy. But we feel CPP is actually a good deal for anyone who could use a defined benefit pension plan that is indexed to inflation with survivor benefits and a death benefit, which I think is most people, unless they have another another pension like that, which I don't think many Canadians do. <laughs> no, no. Despite all the advantages of salary, using some dividends will be important for most corporate owners uh, to keep their corporate investment income uh, growing tax efficiently by releasing the refundable taxes like the RDTOH that we've talked about previously. Now, in our next episodes, we are going to dig deeper into the salary versus dividend debate to explore how to optimally compensate yourself with the right mix. And it's not a, a fixed answer. How that mix changes is going to change as your corporation grows and how the strategy you use will change depending on your province, uh, your corporate investments, and whether you can dividend split or not. So there's a bunch of variables in there that can change the best way to pay yourself. All right. That's the end of our episode on compensating yourself as an incorporated professional. That is we, we said at the beginning this was an ambitious episode, so we, we thank we thank everyone who stuck with us till yeah, the end. Yeah.